Let's build a healthier planet together, one seed at a time through seed saving. It's time to learn all about seed saving, how to seed save, when to harvest seeds, where to store them, how to store them, when to harvest them, where to plant plants when you want to seed save, and does it really matter? And what's the difference between seed saving lettuce seeds and seed saving a tomato seed? Well, there is a big difference. And Brian, the earth grower, is going to tell us all about it. He started his planting journey with seeds when he was just five years old. And by the time he was 16, he had built his own commercial size compost pile with a friend from high school. He's super passionate about seed saving. He's a lifelong learner about regenerative, organic, Korean, natural farming. And I'm really excited for you to tune into everything he has to share with us about seed saving. I'm Natalie Forsbauer, founder and editor-in-chief of Heart and Soil Magazine. Be sure to subscribe to this video, like it, and share it with your friends. If it resonates, it helps more and more people learn about regenerative farming, gardening, and living. living. And if you haven't subscribed to Heart and Soil Magazine yet, head on over to heartandsoulmagazine.com where you can pick up your own subscription for just $39.99 a year. And it's a place where you can connect and learn from regenerative farmers and gardeners and regenerative health practitioners. You make yourself an amazing day. Enjoy the conversation and uh, let us know how your seed saving journey goes. Hello, Earth Grower. How's it going? It's good. How are you? I'm good. Good. Brian, it's great to see you. Me too. How long have your hands been in the earth and in the soil? Um, so I, I first planted uh, seeds when I was in kindergarten, so five years old. Um, I went to a Montessori school and we had a garden at the school, so we started planting stuff in kindergarten. Um, and we had a home garden as well at, at a pretty young age. And my grandpa had planted a lot of fruit trees in like the 1970s. So by the time I was uh, born, they were full size. You know, they were 20 years old by the time I was born. So I, I grew up, um, we lived at my grandpa's uh, house. So we, the house I grew up in was built in the 1800s and we had a really big yard and garden and a lot of uh, fruit trees. And I moved to California when I was in middle school mm -hmm. and didn't do a whole lot of gardening then or in early on in high school, but around the middle of high school, I was about 16 years old. We started, um, a buddy of mine and I, we got really into eating rare fruit, like eating all kinds of exotic mangoes. And we had an Asian market right in the neighborhood that we lived in. So we ate lychees and long and all these different crazy fruits. And, um, that took us down a rabbit hole of learning that um, that there was rare fruit grower societies in our community, and that you could actually grow a lot of um, exotic and tropical fruit where we were in uh, in Phoenix, right? Yeah. And um, so from there, we started getting involved with some of these groups, and we would sit and watch a lot of YouTube videos and we'd stumbled upon a guy, um, Zeke the Sheik, uh, the compost guru of Altadena, California. And <clears throat> he had a uh, really funny videos kind of where he's speaking in rhyme, but kind of speaking really passionately about um, making compost, right? And um, we're sitting there watching this in the middle of the, middle of the night and um, we walk right outside. My buddy's dad had horses in the backyard and we started uh, shoveling the horse manure into a pile and we're like, oh yeah, we're, we're making compost, right? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you know, like just started like immediately. It was for some reason, it was really inspiring to us. And then we progressed with it and realized like, oh, it takes a little more to make compost than, than just this. And, and so we started, um, gathering all of the coffee grounds and stuff from different coffee shops in our area. We had friends who worked at coffee shops and eggshells and our own vegetable scraps and grass clippings and we're getting leaves out of, you know, people's trash bins and stuff like that. And um, ended up with a pretty big compost pile, like I would say almost like a commercial scale compost pile about a hundred feet long and, uh, oh. you know, four feet tall. <clears throat> 
and we're out there, you know, 16 years old out there turning this thing by hand in the hot Arizona sun. And, um, and we started, uh, planting some of these fruit trees at my buddy's mom's house where we had the compost pile and, um, we were planting like bananas and all kinds of different stuff. And he's, he's continued on with this. And we ended up using a, that pile of compost. We had an idea that we were going to sell it at first, but yeah. we ended up using it um, on a big garden on that same property. And that really um, drew a lot of attention to us. A lot of people were like, Whoa, these kids, like they're good at this, you know? And, and um, and then at this around the same time, like that next year, I had an environmental uh, science class in high school where we had an organic garden and we learned about all of the terrible things happening in the world with our water and the environment and uh, mm -hmm. watched all kinds of uh, documentaries and stuff. And we're like, whoa, this is, <laughs> you know, like it was like crazy learning about that stuff as, you know, as a kid, basically. And um that even drove us a little bit more like, whoa, like we need to like take this more seriously. And, um, you know, we started packing our own lunches and drinking out of reusable water bottles and all this kind of stuff, um, rather than, you know, eating the school lunches and, and, um, just kind of had this like, uh, spark of awareness as a, you know, a 16 year old. And I started when we <clears throat> had that garden, people started asking us for help. They started like, oh, like, could you help us build a garden? And mm -hmm. then from there, I'd helped so many people and had my own nice garden at that point at my mom's house. And um, I started getting involved. By the time I was 18, I had people asking me to help them on like real farms. Wow. And so I started uh, farming part-time at 18 really and um so i was i lived in phoenix and i was driving up to sedona uh three days a week so mm -hmm. i was working at like a granola factory we were making um like organic granola and cookies and selling them to whole foods across the country as i was working at a factory doing that so i worked there a few days a week and then i was going and working up in Sedona a few days a week at a farm and also collecting spring water because I'd learned that the water that we were drinking was was not very good and mm -hmm. um, so I was doing both of those things and then I did that for uh, you know a couple years where I was just driving up a few days a week and uh, and then I was I'd stopped working at the factory and I was working at a juice bar mm -hmm. for a little while and um, then I finally just shifted and moved out of Phoenix and moved up to Sedona because I was tired of uh, lugging around water all the time and really all I I didn't want to like work at a juice bar anymore I wanted to I wanted to farm and and I uh, when I went up there and I first started farming I did need to have like a kind of a day job and so I was uh, at first I was working at like a little cafe up there like a couple of days a week and then farming and doing farmers markets and um and doing landscaping as well um because the guy that I was working with had a landscape company so we were installing irrigation systems and digging trenches and doing hardscaping and all of that wall farming and I only worked at that cafe for less than a year and the people who own that cafe they're a family owned an apple orchard like a big well-known apple orchard in that area and they asked me to come work there and so I um, stopped working at the cafe and started working at this apple orchard pretty much full-time so but I was also still doing the vegetable farm so we had 15 acres we were doing it with a little 1943 farm all cub tractor um, with just the two of us and really minimal help, but doing a lot because I was a young guy and had a lot of energy and was could do a lot. Um, he had a lot of energy as well. He's older than I am, about 10 years older than I am. And he, uh, so I was waking up, I, I was living out on the farm. I was living in a little one room cabin 
the little stone hunting cabin um, with no shower. It had running water and like a couple outlets and a wood burning stove and yeah. like stone floor. And it was yeah. just a little one room cabin and I was living out there on the farm. And I would wake up at a, you know, four in the morning and go do my chores around the farm and then uh, be out of there by around eight o'clock and go took me about 30 minutes to drive to the orchard and I would go work on the orchard all day and uh, come home and uh, turn the lights on on the tractor and uh, go a little while longer and uh, do that, did that every day for about five years <laughs> um, and was doing multiple markets. And um, the guy who I was farming with also, he had spent about eight years in Africa so he, he brought me to Africa with him to uh, work on some of the projects he'd already created there and help improve upon them. I did that a couple times around that time frame, And then um, I went on a trip around the world. Um, so I went uh, to like New Zealand and Thailand and Egypt and, um, and then went and spent some more time in Kenya and a little time in Europe and uh, had a lot of time to think about things. And I uh, came to realize that I didn't really want to work at that uh, orchard anymore. I wanted to do something else. Um, so when I got back to Sedona from my trip and I was gone for you know, about four months, um, I uh, was approached by these same people who own that cafe because I would go in there all the time and drink coffee and, uh, you know, and hang out. and. Uh, they wanted to do a farm to table project. Um, so they had just bought an acre of land. And so they had approached me to help them do this uh, one acre market garden. So I did that for about a year and we developed a really productive market garden for them. And it was all like going direct into the restaurant. So all the salad mix and everything, um, a lot of salad mix was some of the main stuff we were growing to uh because they had a lot of salads at this uh, cafe um so i did that for about a year and um this entire time this whole time frame i was also growing cannabis but uh under the caregiver program with another friend in arizona mm -hmm. um so after i'd done that garden i kind of decided that for a while I just didn't want to work for anybody else and I uh, for about a year I did just landscaping and, and we were growing cannabis but I was also moonlighting on that other on a few other orchards uh, you know four or five other orchards because I'd gotten so good at working with fruit trees in the area and I was one of the youngest guys doing it and all the other guys were older and needed help um, so I was working you know, kind of freelance on a lot of orchards and, and doing uh, tree trimming for different um, arborist companies, also like installing irrigation systems and doing hardscaping, and all of that for about a year. And then I was approached with my other, my old partner who I was farming with on the 15 acres, he had acquired another project for a nonprofit organization. And we started, we decided to partner back up again to do this other um, about 15 acre property that was in a different area. Mm. It was owned by a nonprofit organization mm -hmm. and it was an educational farm. So I um, ended up spending about two and a half years helping to build out this farm, adding all the uh, core infrastructure, walk-in coolers and washing stations and irrigation systems and doing cover cropping and getting all of the soil really in order. And mm -hmm. the really great thing about working there is I could experiment a lot. So that's where I really, um, I progressed a lot with my, with my natural farming. But early on, I mean, we were doing natural farming even in the beginning, like, but I didn't know that's what it was. You know, we were, we were using EM1 and we were making compost teas and but I didn't have like a term for it yet and so when I was working at the nonprofit is really when I discovered uh, Korean natural farming and really went deep in that rabbit hole and they were really interested in me doing it being a Korean organization so that the entire organization is a Korean owned 
organization or citizens organization and um so they, they uh, allowed me to really progress with that a lot and but a cool thing there is I, I got to teach a lot so there was I had six interns at one point and um, we would host big groups of people you know from around the world we would have people coming from Korea who didn't speak English and had someone translating what I was saying to them and um, did a lot of neat things at that farm a lot of experimenting and <clears throat> we added uh, chickens and all of that was not necessarily it wasn't for profit we were giving away a lot of the food so we had a lot of room to uh to have fun with it and to really uh try to empower the community and teach people and so i spent almost three years doing that and um also like still moonlighting on other projects and things while I was doing that to try to make more money because there wasn't a lot of money in the nonprofit world. Um, so I was still doing tree trimming and orchard work and other stuff as well. And um, I decided after about, it was probably two and a half years of, of working there that I, I wanted to move on and, and, and do something else. So and then the timing of it was right because there was someone else who came up. We added another team member who was, you know, interested in maybe taking over and the, the timing worked out well. And the just there's this kind of theme where new things show up like right as I'm exiting an, another thing. And so I was approached to do, um, do a commercial cannabis grow. Um, about three hours south of, of where I was with a, with a good friend of mine and they um the grow that we were going to work at like they had lost their their growers um so we came into just a mess you know just a bunch of uh just craziness and um but we we got it all in order we whipped it into shape i mean we we had a bunch of moms that were hermaphrodite and just all kinds of problems we we came into and um and and fixed all of those things but and I, and I did it for a while and, you know, and the money was nice and, and all of those things, but we were uh, also growing hydroponically, which mm. was not super appealing to me. I did glaze over several things. Like I did go to school for hydroponics, you know, during this time, like uh, when I was living in uh, near Sedona, there's an ag school there and I, and I took, I almost have an ag degree. I need like three more classes to have an ag degree. Um, but uh, so I knew how to do hydroponics and was familiar with it. But when we were doing everything under the uh, medical program, we were doing, you know, straight super soil with teas and all of the, you know, the different natural farming techniques. Mm -hmm. And that was really what got us noticed for this commercial grow. And when we got into doing the grow, we came to realize that they didn't actually want what we showed them. They wanted us to do what we were told. And um, so I did that for a while. And I, um, I chose to leave and my business partner chose to stay. And from there, I, we went and same thing, another project kind of fell into my lap. There was a, maybe a minor lull there. Um, and we moved back up near Sedona and there was another project waiting for me. So yeah. there it was about 75 acres um, with some people who were at retirement age and had owned this land and had a good amount of funding behind them mm -hmm. to, uh, to build a farm. They wanted a full regenerative farm, right? Oh. And, um, so my girlfriend and I, uh, we moved up there and we moved on site to this farm in, in Clarkdale, Arizona. And we spent about eight months building the, a farm from scratch. But we were able to move fairly quickly because we had the money behind us to, to make things happen fairly quickly. So we added all of the uh, core infrastructure, walking coolers, um, all of the uh, washing stations, like in complete custom stuff too. I designed all of it and um, we built five greenhouses, so four caterpillar tunnels, one high tunnel, built out an entire um, like controlled environment, uh, indoor grow room for starting seedlings, um, 
and uh, rejuvenated a hundred tree orchard that was just hadn't been touched in like 20 years. So I spent almost two months just, just pruning and chipping. Um, we added a hundred chickens. We built four mobile chicken coops. Um, we did a lot. We designed the entire irrigation system, installed timers. Um, and we were able to um, do a lot of filming and stuff while we were there, which was really great. Um, and that, that actually drew a lot more attention to the, to the work that we were doing that particular project. We had some attention before that more locally, but that one, like, I started having companies and stuff reaching out to us after we started doing that project. And um, that was, we had planned on staying there for three years. Mm -hmm. And that one, just, it wasn't the right fit for us to, to stay that long. Mm -hmm. So we, we chose to leave. And from there, I've just, I shifted gears to like, I had, I was in a position financially where I could really choose what it is that I wanted to do. And now I've gotten more into doing consulting and uh, doing microscope work, doing soil work um, and traveling around the country, helping different farms to set up their core infrastructure. Um, and I've been able to help quite a few um, even after that project and it's uh it's been really amazing that's really cool and you have a lot of experience and you have a lot of training right because you've done yeah. a lot of culture courses at school and then you've done um you've trained with uh, chris trump right you've done his his I training a, i did the training with chris trump i did mm -hmm. the training with elaine ingham online and in person um when, when did you do that i'm curious so I did the online training about three years ago. Um, and then the, just recently I trained with her in person with the uh, catalyst uh, microbes or catalyst bio amendments um, in Malibu. Um, Cause Malibu is not too far from where I am. So I, I jumped at that opportunity. Um, yeah. And I, I go to a lot of conferences and mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I've had really great mentors and I've, made a point to put myself out there and connect with people smarter than myself and and um reading acres magazine has really a hard driving force and a, a lot my um my mentor at the orchard read acres magazine he would give me his old magazines um mm -hmm. after he finished them for a long time and then i i subscribed and that uh has been really a, a great source of inspiration and hope for me for many years of looking to people that are smarter than myself or more experienced uh, as a source of inspiration. And um, this past year, we went to the Acres Conference and that was actually really amazing at um, meeting some of these people and like how well received I was by them. And it was really felt super good. Um, That's awesome. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, I. I try to be as humble as I can. I did glaze over several things. I gave you the, the hard points, <laughs> but uh, we've been doing it for about 11 years straight now. I've uh, been pretty prolific and tried to do as, as much as I possibly could. I worked seven days a week for almost uh, six years straight. Um, Brian, yeah, <laughs> I think this magazine is such a good resource. So thanks for mentioning that. Yeah. Um, I, one of the things that you were telling me that you're really passionate about is uh, seed saving, and yeah. So I was wondering if you could tell us more about that. Like, what yeah, do we? Absolutely. What do? How do? How does a person start? And um, what are some of the things that you would tell a new seed saver to do? Yeah. So I started seed saving really more, I had, was saving seeds in the home garden and um, wasn't super good at it. You know, I made a ton of mistakes. I really started seed saving more intensely when I started doing that um, early farm when I was about 18 years old, like, because my mentor had a ton of experience seed saving. And he was really good friends with uh, Jared Gettle from um, Baker Creek and, mm -hmm. you know, and went to their wedding. And, you know, he had a, a lot of experience with seed saving that he, imparted up upon me and really the best seeds are seeds that were allowed to finish on the plant you know that really were allowed to go through their process and adapt to your region because 
if you get them too early, some of them may be viable, but a lot of them are not going to really hold all of the potential that they could if, mm -hmm. if you were to allow them to really like pretty much die out there in the yeah. field and dry up and sun dry and, and then collect them is, is pretty critical. I mean, that's not the same when you're collecting from fruit. That's more like you're doing Swiss chard or you're doing flowers or lettuce or things mm -hmm. where you're going to dry sift, not necessarily um, do wet processing, right? Mm -hmm. And the one thing that was a big learning moment for me was that I need to, when you are doing wet processing, there's a fermentation process that needs to happen uh, to really get the best seeds. And yeah, so tell, us, tell us what wet processing is, like what would, what seed would we wet process, for example? So wet processing would be, and I, uh, I'll send you the article that I, that I wrote. I finished it. I'm, I'm vetting it right now, but okay. I have a thousand words for you already, but, awesome. um, but wet processing is very much like fruit processing so mm -hmm. like tomatoes your cucumbers melons um you know you, those are the things that you generally would save seeds from in terms of fruit like if you were to save seeds from like an apple or an orange um mm -hmm. you could do that but it would make an entirely different uh apple every apple seed is completely unique and would make an entirely different apple that's why most of those are, um, when you're looking for a particular variety, you would do that from uh, grafting or from cuttings. But, um, but with good heirloom vegetable varieties, they will grow true to seed. Um, so when you take it through this fermentation process, which I was touching on for wet processing, you're very much mimicking what's happening in nature. So in nature, the fruit is designed to likely be pecked by animals and to fall to the ground and rot right underneath the plant and go through a process of fermentation and the microbiology in that fermentation process actually cleans many of the pathogens off the seeds and primes them to uh, to grow better so if you're collecting seeds from your tomatoes it's better to, of course, you need to select the tomatoes that you like, that look the way that you would like and have the kind of flavor and from the plant that is yielding the kind of genetics that you would like to see. Maybe it was the last one that had tomatoes on it or it was drought tolerant or many other reasons why you would select from a particular plant. But then you're gonna select the tomato that's the one that looks like the one that, that you wanna keep growing. And, but once you've done that, collected those tomatoes, it's a good idea to actually set those somewhere and let them kind of get soft and begin to uh, to rot a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, because that is going to take them through the process where you're going to actually get much more viability out of these seeds and they're, they're going to grow much better and have stronger potential in genetics through allowing to, them to go through that process, which can be kind of gross. Like a, a rotting tomato does not smell good. Um, but once you've done that, and they don't have to completely rot, they don't need to be covered in mold or anything, but getting yeah. softer where the fermentation yeah. process is, you know, you wouldn't really eat, want to eat the tomato at this mm -hmm. point. Um, and from there, I would um, squeeze those seeds into a sieve or a strainer where I can then begin to rinse them off. Um, I'm gonna give them a good rinse and then I might even put them in a jar of water and shake them around a bit and really get them rinsed off pretty well. And, you know, just for a few minutes and then give them a final rinse at the sink. And I'm gonna lay those out to, um, to air dry. Using a fan can actually not be as good. Air drying is, mm. is, is better. Um, the fan can be problematic sometimes. It might blow some of the seeds off. It might dry them a little too fast also. Okay. And that's going to depend on your environment, of course. Mm -hmm. um, from there, once they're dried, I'm going to put those into a envelope, like a paper envelope. Paper is going to actually create some osmotic pressure that will actually pull some of the, the excess moisture that's out of there. So putting them in paper over a um, Ziploc baggie or something is actually a lot better. And you don't wanna necessarily go straight into a jar either. Um, getting them in that paper for the, a little lengthened 
drying process is actually really helpful. And to take that even to another level, you could put um, a little silicone um, packet, like what people will put for preservation of, of foods and, and seeds. You could put that in there with them for maybe about a week. And after that, you could you could probably remove that silicone packet and then store them long term in a in a mason jar inside. And having them inside that paper is actually really helpful for the fluctuating environment that we're in. So the paper, if it ends up being a little more humid, um, will actually help quite a bit to adjust the environment inside the jar. Um, so that's how I tend to store seeds. There's many other ways you could do it. You could even uh, you could loop for air sealing them over doing uh, the jar. You could store them just in the envelopes, but they're not gonna last as long. Um, so that tends to be the way that, that I do it. Um, for, for dry processing, on the other hand, um, I do that different ways. So sometimes I will really sieve them out and get all the debris and the chaff and all of those things out of the seed if that's more if I'm aiming for a longer term storage. Mm -hmm. um, but other times, if I know that I'm not going to store the seed very long, I may just slough off all that chaff, like say I'm saving lettuce. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, fuzzies and chaff and all this kind of stuff that's in lettuce seed. And I may just slough all that off into a bucket and set it aside because so there's a really interesting thing that you can do with that because there's the chaff and there's all this material in there with the seed mixed in with it when you then direct plant with all of that mm -hmm. the density of the seeds is actually really nice it's almost ideal because you're not just spreading the seed you're spreading other material with it that then spreads the seed out in a very nice even way that um, actually eliminates work. Um, so um, sometimes I'll do it that way. If I'm if it's longer term storage, the that chaff and all of the fuzzies and stuff can actually cause problems and decrease the viability of the seed. Mm. But if I know that I'm going to uh, plant that relatively soon thereafter, collecting, then or maybe it's only going to sit around for a, a month or two. Yeah. Um, then I, I might save some of that in there. It's then, but if you're planting into trays, then you have to sift through all that stuff and find the seeds. But if I'm just putting it into the ground, I've noticed that when I leave the chaff and I leave all the debris, that um, the density that I get is very close to the densities that I get by using a, a push seeder that regulates the seed. Uh, and that can be a really fun experience. It's kind of a not a lot of people consider that. <laughs> yeah, I love that idea. And so what's a short time and what's a long time to store those seeds, Brian, when you're talking? Um, so if I'm storing for like a long time, like I usually don't try to store seeds for longer than like a couple years. Um, okay. But you, the idea with, especially with seed saving is if you're saving them in your region and you, you don't necessarily have the intention of selling them, Every mm -hmm. time you plant them, they're becoming more adapted to your farm and more mm -hmm. adapted to your region. So you do want to plant them every year because yeah. they're going to get better every year. And also you're going to maintain viability. And if you let them sit around too long, maybe you lose them mm -hmm. and then you lost genetics. Right. And so that's not really great. But um, I tend to try to plant them every year um, if I can to make the genetics stronger for the region that I'm growing in and to maintain viability. New seeds are always going to grow better than old ones. The yeah. old ones will still grow. <laughs> um, but um, that tends to be the way that I do it. And yeah. I, I don't save them longer than a year in, in general. But but yeah. some stuff I do save longer. Um, the like what? Bigger seeds tend to maintain viability a little bit longer than smaller ones do. So mm -hmm. things like squash and watermelon and things that have larger seeds mm -hmm. can maintain viability for, for a lot longer. So mm -hmm. I've had watermelon seeds um, that I'd been had sitting around for like five years and had almost 100% germination rate on, but I stored them very well. So okay. if you intend to store them for a long time, 
that's where I would probably go with an envelope, maybe even a long-term silicone packet, air sealed, maybe even in the fridge. <laughs> you know, if I'm if I'm yeah. you know go seed bank. Fridge or, yeah, fridge or freezer or either. Either one. Um, the freezer I think is a little bit better. Um, okay. The the fridge, depending on your fridge. Mm. Um, could maintain a little bit higher moisture than inside mm -hmm. the freezer, um, which could cause issues depending on how uh, sealed up your seeds are. Um, right. I've done that where I uh, had seeds in like a mason jar and put them in the fridge and <laughs> you know, they start sprouting inside the jar, <laughs> um, yeah. th things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, so, I'm wondering about um, seed saving typically happens when our plants go to seed or um, when we're harvesting um, a, or letting our tomatoes rot on the vine. Right. I'm wondering though, what do we need to be thinking about in the springtime when we're getting ready for our season about seed saving? What, what do we need to keep in our mind about how we're planting, where we're planting, when we're planting, or does any of that matter? No, it does matter. Absolutely. Um, so when you're seed saving, if you have the intention of seed saving every year, well, the way that I do it is I block out areas that I know that I'm going to seed save from. That way I don't treat those as um, high turnover production zones. So a lot of the time, like when you're growing lettuces or quick turnover greens like that, mm -hmm. you're getting a few cuts off of it, you're removing it, you're planting that same bed almost mm -hmm. immediately the same day, right? So those are not ones that I'm going to save seed from, but generally I'll set aside a row or two that are segregated from the rest of the garden um, where I intend to save seed from them. Also, it depends on what you're saving seed from. So if you're, especially if you're on like a cannabis farm, you do not probably want to save lettuce seed because all those fuzzies are going to end all over your trichomes and it's could be a problem. So if you were, if were doing a cannabis farm and you had lettuce seed you wanted to save, I would keep that way far away from your cannabis because those all those fuzzies are going to end up all over your trichomes. But, right. So when um, you say way far away, how is how far is that? Uh, you know, as far, the wind carries stuff a long way. So I would saying? say you know another side of the farm at least. Like a hundred yeah. feet, a mile. Not a mile, you know, at least a hundred feet, I would say. Feet, okay. But maybe even a little further if you're gonna okay. save seed from something like lettuce. Not yep. all seeds, not all plants are gonna make those fuzzy flowers like mm. lettuce does though. Mm -hmm. um, but another thing to consider is if you wanna save from like watermelon or from squash or from mm -hmm. corn for that matter, they cross pollinate via the wind. Yeah. So, um, you have to really segregate those pretty well to be able to get a viable seed out of them. Well, the seeds will be viable, but they'll be cross-pollinated. So you may end up with some kind of, and I've done this, some kind of weird squash melon hybrid. Yeah. Um, and the, the interesting thing is if you've ever been to the Heirloom Seed Expo in California, there's over like 4,000 types of squash. And this is why, because they all cross-pollinate with each other. <laughs> and like, um, there's probably more than that. That's what they had on display. <laughs> um, but I know sometimes we've, I've had customers bring in seeds um, from their different summer squash that they have and they, they're, and they want us to grow it for them for the next year. And, um, but they've also planted, uh, you know, their winter squash and their melons all around it. And I, I try to explain to them that we will not get, we'll probably won't get the same squash for you right, <laughs> with these, right. you know, because of that cross pollination. So that's a really, right. really good tip. Absolutely. So how far apart do we have to plant? So if I'm wanting to save my zucchini seeds and I'm wanting to save my watermelon seeds, how far apart to those two? I would seeds? usually go um, at least a hundred feet away. You know, okay, so, but yeah. but that doesn't mean you're not going to cross pollinate because the wind is uh, is pretty mm -hmm. be pretty crazy depending on where you are. Um, but I've had success um, being able to keep my varieties pretty separate by putting them at least a hundred feet away. If they're right next to each other, I mean, pretty much guaranteed they're going to cross pollinate with each other. But 
if if you put enough distance between them, um, you should be okay. But but if you have the the ability to do it, like literally put them like on the other side of the farm from one another, like that's gonna be even better. Um, and likely they won't cross pollinate. And it also depends on how you're growing them. So like I find that if you grow your cucumbers with trellising or you grow your squash with trellising they actually cross pollinate a lot easier because there's yeah. more airflow um, if you grow them on the ground which i actually really like doing a lot of the time mm -hmm. they're less likely to cross pollinate because the wind is less likely to go that low sometimes mm -hmm. you know depending on how the winds are working or also if you put some kind of another trick is you could put a barrier you know you could use like rime uh or shade cloth or something yep. we try to diminish that a little bit um Good and also idea. look it, it, it's only happens when they're in flower so those are things to think about as well um but usually if you have them at least 100 feet away like you're diminishing the odds quite a bit but those are things to consider and corn very easily cross pollinates. There's a ton of people getting in trouble with, you know, their GMO and stuff cross pollinating with their heirloom and yeah. people them trying to sue them. And it's pretty crazy with the corn, but corn is amazing. Corn being a C4 grass has the ability to sequester more carbon than almost any other plant. And when you, when you consider that the amount of corn being grown, if it was grown using good regenerative practices, how much that would affect the climate change with the scale of corn but it's the wrong kind of corn and it uses yeah. the wrong kind of practices but if it was good corn with good practices that's actually very good for the environment chris trump gave an example of this guy uh, dr parks on the big island of hawaii grew corn and he put a one corn seed every i think three feet on an acre of land that was all just lava rock just straight lava rock, which this has a ton of paramagnetic properties that plants really like. But um, a, a corn seed has enough energy in just the seed to grow four feet tall and just with the energy of the seed. And in doing that is gonna create just as much root mass. And what he, what he did is he grew these corn seeds every three feet, one corn seed and did this over the course of a few years and did nothing else, incorporated back in the corn stalks and everything, of course, mm -hmm. and was able to just through doing that, build a couple inches of topsoil in, in a couple of years, doing only that. Um, um, so corn is very powerful, <laughs> but- um, That's amazing. <laughs> My dad started um, saving his corn seed a few years ago and he just loves it. He, I think it, seed saving has become one of his favorite things, I'm sure. Yeah, um, seed yeah. saving is really special. It's it's something we've been doing for a long time, and it's really the the seeds that we save from our regions. They they hold stories, and they hold culture, and they hold many really important things about people's culture. I mean, food is a core pe part of people's cultural identity, and that starts with the seeds that they grew that food from. And you know, even in Mexico, like there's every different uh, region of Mexico has a different corn that they grow that's a part of their culture, the different colors of corn and for different things. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's really amazing. And, and every culture has something like that. And, and then when people have immigrated around the world or traveled, a lot of the time they're, they're bringing their seeds with them. And this is how a lot of these things have spread. And if we don't continue to grow some of these genetics, they'll they'll be lost. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, through breeding and through even just through uh, growing your seed and adapting it over, we're able to gain new varieties. And it's really a very amazing thing. What we it, it, I don't know of anything that holds the kind of magic that a seed does. It's like something so small that can turn into something so abundant with just setting the right conditions and the right um, care, you know, it, it can, what it can do is, I don't know of anything else that can do that. That's, <laughs> I, I am obsessed with seeds. <laughs> what do you love about it? I mean, you've talked about the stories and the, um, the magic of it. What, like when you think of 
seed saving, what do you love? I, I, I love the abundance as, as part of it, you know, like the amount of seeds that you can get off one plant, like is mind blowing. And like, I love that abundance. I love the, the tradition behind it. I love getting like, it's, it's this very, um, just connected process. It feels as though I'm connected to some kind of ancient practice when I, when I'm doing it, you know, there's certain things that we do in the garden or in life that feel like ingrained in us in some way. And, and seed saving really hits on that. It really resonates with something deeply ingrained in us as humans to connect with the earth. And, and I really see, you know, beyond the stories and traditions, it, it, there's so many lessons to be learned. When you look at a seed growing, so you, you plant a seed and it sprouts up and it has enough energy to get to a certain stage. And then it starts to team with the life around it and goes through its process and makes fruit or flowers and, and then finally will make seed and it dies and leaves those seeds for the next generation right and it's a really beautiful story because every form of life is at some stage in this story it's a story that's a common story for every form of life we're all and process of this story and when you grow plants and, and you save seed I think it's one of the most beautiful opportunities to, to witness this story and, and to see it for yourself and to realize that we're, we're not separate of this. It, it brings us closer to it. It's, it's a really powerful teacher. Um, beyond the sovereignty that we get from doing it and, and all of the other aspects of why it's beneficial, I think it has the ability to be the, one of the catalysts that really breaks the... the breaks the spell. I feel as though there's, we've forgotten how, how intimately connected we are with this earth and with the soil and all of the life that we share that, um, that story and witnessing that can really, uh, bring us back in sync. That's what it's done for me. Um, I love that, Brian. That's so powerful. And if I was saving seeds for the very first time, where would you tell me to start? Like what seeds, where should I start? Which ones would I save first? I would probably start with um, like lettuces are pretty easy to start with. Um, anything that is a self-pollinating plant is a good place to start. So like lettuces and brassicas like kale and Swiss chards and, and uh, radishes are really great. Um, and I, I would start with those, but also some of the easier ones for like, say, um, wet processing are larger seeds. So like watermelon, if you can keep it segregated is pretty easy because you don't necessarily have to go through that rinsing process and all of that with the watermelon. Same thing with squashes. You don't necessarily need to do that. Um, if you could let them ferment a bit, with watermelons, it's hard for me to let that, them do that because I want to eat it, you know, it's, <laughs> but it's um, so a lot of the time I don't actually take watermelon through the fermentation process. I pick them out as I'm eating them and yeah. that, that still works really well. Um, so, so, you know, start saving seeds with what you're, what you like to eat is really a, a good place to start. But some of the more challenging ones are, you know, tomatoes are a little, can be a little challenging to get good viable seed. If you don't um, take it through that fermentation and rinse them well and dry them well and store them well, yes, you can, it could be as simple as cutting a slice of a tomato and putting it in soil. I've seen videos of people doing this and it can be done, um, but the quality and the viability and the genetic potential of the seed will be far greater if you do take it through this uh, fermentation process. And it's really understanding nature of like, that is the process that it would go through if you didn't do anything. And mm -hmm. that's, you wanna mimic that as much as possible of like, how would, how does nature do it? You know, so that's why I'm a big advocate of letting the, like if I'm saving lettuce or any of these other seeds, I'm gonna let that plant full on die out there. And mm. when it starts to, and I take care of them for a while after they start to form seeds, I'll still maybe even fertilize a little bit because it's going to make the seeds a little stronger. Right. And when um, you say fertilize, what do you fertilize them with? 
usually maybe with some calcium or something like that I, I would use um, or or trace minerals, but I'm not going to be feeding nitrogen and things like that once they form and feed. That's not really what they're looking for. They may be looking for a little more phosphorus, a little more calcium, much like if you were in flour, because that's exactly right. what they're doing. <laughs> um, and I guess like what, where would you get that calcium and phosphorus from if you're looking for um, organic and yeah, so I, I tend to use um, a water-soluble calcium. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would um, take eggshells and do a 1 to 10 ratio of eggshells and a good living vinegar, like apple cider vinegar you made yourself is mm -hmm. great too. Or, um, you know, brown rice vinegar is also really good and has a lot of other properties, but tends to be a little more expensive and not as available. Um, yeah. so you could use any of those vinegars and I'm going to let that sit for about a week, yeah. um, before I use it and strain that. And I'll, I'll use that at a one to 500 or a one to a thousand, um, depending on what I'm seeing with the plants. And often I would do mix that with other pre and natural farming inputs mm -hmm. to make a complete solution. Um, and that is one way that it can be done. There are other, uh, very DIY um, calcium supplements that I've used in the past. You could uh, dilute milk. You could use whole milk also. Mm -hmm. Works quite well, believe it or not. Um, and I usually will dilute that at about a one to 10 ratio as well. Um, and you can spray that. But what will happen when you use milk is it's gonna leave a bunch of little white spots all over your plant. And you may think you have powdery mildew or something. And you know this just can be confusing. Yeah. Um, or you're, you're not an advocate of supporting purchasing milk, you know, so those, yeah. they're all those kinds of things, but the eggshells work quite well. You could also use uh, oyster shells in, mm -hmm. in lieu of that, or uh, coral sand mm -hmm. also works quite well um, if you don't have, because when you do the eggshells, you're going to need to remove the membrane from them, so you're going to need to roast them and mm -hmm. fan off the inner membrane, though it will still work if you don't remove the membrane. You've lost shelf stab stability of your calcium. That mm -hmm. calcium will begin to rot and smell really nasty if you leave that membrane in there over time. Mm -hmm. In the short term, it totally works. Um, but in the long term, you've just uh, eliminated a resource for yourself. Right. Um, so you don't want to make it and store it. You want to make it and use it if you don't take off the membrane. Yeah, if you could leave the membrane and you can use it, but you're not going to store it well. Yeah. So just yeah. that's one thing to keep in mind. But um, great tips. Great tips. Mm -hmm. But also, um, so I'm I am a big advocate of letting the 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 plant finish its process, you know, mm -hmm. and really put all its final energy into those seeds in every way that it can, and team with that environment to make the best seeds that are gonna be from your farm. That's that's very con uh, is a context thing. Like what, how mm -hmm. am I, what stimulus is on these seeds and why am I saving them is, yeah. is an important thought to have. Yeah, and so I just, um, for people who've never ever seed saved before and never let that lettuce plant pass the point of being edible, um, can you just walk us through what we might be watching for and looking for when you say to, growing to full viability so right because right now you know i've only seen a lettuce plant for example i don't know what the next thing is and i've seen right. some weird lettuce plants that um i might not have picked on time but i really actually don't know what those are either so can you just right right walk me absolutely through? absolutely so um what will start to happen say you're using a lettuce plant you're going to save seed from that what will happen is the lettuce will start to become bitter that's one of the first things that's going to happen and it's going to become bitter for a reason. It becomes bitter, so it's not appealing to wildlife, um, including us. And that's part of the beginning of the process when you're that's starting to bolt, is what it would be called. So the plant will start to bolt, and actually the morphology of the plant will start to look far different than it originally looked. It will start to get taller and have somewhat of a, a pine tree kind of structure happening where it's getting narrower as it's getting to the top and then eventually if you allow it to continue through that process it will make a stalk that will then make flowers and 
those flowers will dry out to make seed. And that's really the, the process they'll go through. And, and that will vary from plant to plant, but what's common among leafy greens is that the leaves will start to become more bitter. Um, mm. And that is, they're creating compounds to protect themselves from not only uh, wildlife, but from insects so that they can go through their process and create seeds because that is truly the end result of any annual plant is that right. they are going to make seeds and they're gonna die. Right. Um, you know, perennials, they grow a little bit differently. They also produce seed, but they might continue to grow themselves as mm -hmm. well. So mm -hmm. um, the process is a little different with, and perennials are, uh, can be easy to become attached to because of this. You know, um, we don't want to become attached to annuals realizing their natural process and seeing the beauty in it and realizing that the seeds that I'm going to get are going to allow me to have this experience again and it may even be a little bit better yeah. um, and it's it's a powerful lesson and then letting go and not yeah. being a, not having attachment right yeah. and uh, it is very easy to become attached to fruit trees and other other uh, perennials though yeah, they're is. longer lived <laughs> That's really cool. And so then what you're saying is to let them fully die off and then harvest the... Yeah, so they'll, what will happen is they'll start to produce flowers, but then the plant will actually begin to die. And once it's gotten to the point where it's actually made good viable flowers and you start to see the plant, the leaves start to get crunchy and, and, and die, right? Mm -hmm. um, then you know that it's time to probably stop watering. Um, mm -hmm. You do want to water through some of the process um, mm -hmm. to allow the plant to have the energy necessary to make really good seeds. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a little fertilizer, like I was saying, it can, can also be helpful to make very, very good viable seeds um, where you're getting higher germination rates. And in general, if you've never, um, your first round of seeds that you save likely will have lower viability than the next ones. So that is that is also one thing to consider where in general, from my first round of seeds that I save, even if done really well and they go through the entire process, I may see between a 50 and 70% germination rate on them. But over time, when uh, saved really well and stored properly, you can get closer to about a 90 to maybe 98, 100% germination rate when, when done very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, so that is one thing to consider is if you're going to take the time to save the seed, you do mm -hmm. want it to grow. Because um, if you cut corners, then you're decreasing the percentage of it that's gonna grow and all of the sifting and the work that you, that you went through may not be as worth it as, as you thought it was right. going to be. <laughs> right, that totally makes sense, man. Yeah. Well, this has been really valuable, Brian. Thank you so much for yeah, absolutely. just uh, like a small sliver of your wisdom around seed saving and, yeah. and the journey of farming. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm happy to talk with you. Yeah, um, including, is there anything that we never touched on about seed saving that you'd like to um, amplify? The, well, we touched on some of the process. We touched on some of the philosophy we touched on storage you know these are these are all important things um then um the stories and all that those are these are really some of the key points that i feel are, are super important um but also uh sharing them is very important so when you end up the one of the reasons that i really love the abundance of seed saving is you end up with more than you need and you can share some of these with your friends mm -hmm. and they can, um, that can actually also be very beneficial because when sharing with your friends, if you happen to lose the genetics, they may still have them and you could get them mm -hmm. back, which is, uh, can be, I've experienced that before where I've had some crop failures and thought I lost certain genetics, but then my friends had them and I was able to get them back. And that sharing that gives you the ability to do that, but also gives you the ability to share the abundance. You know, it's this life we're living is 
this has a circular nature to it and things tend to come back around when you when you give them freely um, without expectation and um, I'm a big fan of doing that because you always end up with more than you need if you're if you're doing seed saving properly um, so being able to share them and uh, give that to others is is a great it's a great energetic exchange it's a great experience to uh, to have for everybody yeah, it, I'm so glad you brought that up because when we were talking about it, I had this vision and this hit, and I don't, I don't know if it's happening anywhere already in the in the world or within the school system, but we um we've you know brought some schools have brought in community gardens or you know growing a bean seed or whatever that is, and I was like, well, wouldn't it be amazing if if they took that to the next level where they're actually creating seeds and then doing seed exchanges through schools? Right, right. that would be so powerful for. Yeah. That would be amazing. We were we started a seed bank at the nonprofit farm where I was at, and that was mm-hmm. one of the first like more official seed banks that I I'd always been saving seed for a long time. But that was like a real seed bank where people could come and, and gain access to it. And um, wow, yeah, it's really great getting kids involved with this stuff and mm-hmm. come to realize that the experiences that I had. Um, are not common. <laughs> um, they're, not, they're not common, Brian, and we need to share them more. So you touch on seed banks. Where else? Because there's, I know there's like seedy Saturdays where people get together and share seeds, and then there's right. seed banks. Um, I've even seen um those little houses. You know, some people put like library seed right. book libraries up. I'm seeing seed libraries pop up in neighborhoods, right. which is really cool. What are some other things that um, you've seen around the world to yeah, share seeds? So, um, yeah, seed swaps are amazing. The uh, community builders, um, especially if you're in your region, so you're going to be able to get some. If there's some really old seed savers, you're going to be able to get some really strong genetics of people who've been doing it for like over 50 years, which is yeah. really cool to get your hands on some of that stuff. Or, or even um, getting involved with organizations like uh, Native Seed Search or Rocky mm-hmm. Mountain Seed Alliance, or these very regional seeds where people are working to preserve ancient seeds that are indigenous seeds is is really great if you can be involved with helping to preserve some of those genetics that are very very old is is amazing um going to uh, seed expos is also really really cool um there's the one in that's in missouri um with baker creek they do a spring planting festival which is a, a seed big seed swap festival they also do one in uh, same company Baker Creek does one in California the heirloom seed expo and and Santa Rosa Mm -hmm. is both of those are just incredible to not only gain access to things you've never seen before but to build community around seed saving the amount of people that come out for these kinds of things is really inspiring to see like whoa you know I'm not the only one like this you can you can nerd out on on seed saving with others um there are some good Facebook groups and stuff as well, um, mm-hmm. but usually trying to work um, with local seed savers is, is the best because you're ahead of the curve. You have stuff that's already adapted to your region, but yes. um, but starting with a good heirloom seed company, you know, Baker Creek is pretty good. They have mm-hmm. gone all over the world to get a lot of their stuff, but you're going to still need to adapt it to your region because yeah. it wasn't saved in your region so yeah. that um there's always that kind of uh first year where you're adapting over and that's that's part of the reason that you're not necessarily going to have the same kind of uh, germination rates or viability because mm-hmm. it's adapting to your environment but that next round is going to be even better um so getting involved with those kinds of things is is really great um I know some people who uh, have mailing lists as well, where they kind of do like uh, seed mailers where you get a couple of different seeds in the mail each month. That's pretty cool and fun. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of different things that you can look into, but just looking into where like, like a local seed bank is a really great place to start or looking at like, are there seed swaps happening in my area? And mm-hmm. a lot of the time there is. <laughs> yeah you yeah just need to look um, right that's right and even local libraries like the library where you go get books they a lot of them have seed libraries um if you ask you know so yeah. those are things to look into as well um and just when you do save the seeds 
understanding how important they are and um, and doing it with care and doing it mindfully because you're holding um, something really powerful. You're holding something that has a strong catalyst effect that is exponential of what it could mean to the people you share it with or what it could mean to your community or what it could teach you. You know, this is something um, not to be overlooked. It's you mm -hmm. should do it with, if you're going to do it, do it with care. You know, of course you'll make some mistakes and leave room for that too, but uh, um, definitely do it as mindfully as possible. And, and also when storing these things, I glazed over the fact that you should definitely um, label them very well. Yes, That's yes. Important <laughs> um, with with dates, the varieties, um, where what even what portion of your garden you saved it from. All of these things are are helpful um, in helping you to improve the process and, and taking good notes is also very helpful. Um, that way that we can set the stage of a baseline for. Um, constant improvement where we can get better at these things each year if we don't document them likely we'll forget um mm -hmm. and uh how do we improve right right yeah brian thank you thank you Absolutely. for seeding us with your wisdom and what you've learned and may we take that and a seed that within our own learnings and seed saving Joel, thank you so much, Brian. I really appreciate your time. Appreciate you sharing your heart and your wisdom. You're Absolutely. amazing. I look forward yes. to amplifying more of what you do. Absolutely. Reach out anytime. All right. Thanks. Okay. Make right, yourself bye. a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Grateful you joined us for that conversation and interview. If you haven't subscribed to Heart and Soil Magazine yet, head over to heartandsoilmagazine.com. Click on that subscribe button and join us for just... $39.99 a year. You make yourself an amazing day and I'm really grateful you're part of our community.